We're joined in uh, this portion of our program on the Sunday Magazine. I'm Bob Solter, joined by Melissa Negrin Wiener. Uh, Melissa is a partner at Genser Kona Elder Law on Long Island. She manages the Government Benefits Department. Their website is Genser Law. That's G E N S E R L A W. That's all as one word. dot com. And she has joined us on our program. We're going to be talking about a number of things in the area of uh, elder law and uh, get into talking about some senior scams and some other interesting areas as well. First of all, it's nice to have you join us on our program. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I guess in beginning our discussion, um, a little bit of background, if you would, on um, Genser Law in terms of what exactly does an elder law firm do? Uh, Sure. Um, So elder law really encompasses quite a bit. Uh, We do everything from uh, some estate planning work where we help people with their power of attorney, health care proxy, living wills, their wills. We we handle trusts, asset protection planning, Medicaid applications for both home care and nursing home care, guardianship work, and then... um, we help with administration of the state's litigation uh, during that administration if it comes up. So really uh, are able to help and stay with families from beginning to end. This idea of estates and estate planning, how does that differ from elder law? Well, the estate planning is more of the, uh, the documentation, the power of attorney, health care proxy, living will, putting these, uh, pa- these documents in place to make sure that there's somebody name to help you handle uh, anything that you might need to handle if you become incapacitated um, or just need assistance, um, setting up wills and trusts to make sure that your assets pass to whom you want when you pass away. The elder law is more of the um, the Medicaid, the Medicaid applications, the asset protection planning, um, guardianship. So there aren't a lot of firms that do both. So you'll hear somebody referred to as a trust and estates attorney, where they do mainly the documentation, the estate administration, um, and then the elder law brings in the planning, the Medicaid, and things like that. So it's nice to be able to do both because then you can see everything through with, and stay with the family. They don't have to go someplace else. Many of us have heard of the term power of attorney. What does that actually mean? Power of attorney is a document where you uh, name someone to make financial decisions for you if you can't make your own. Someone who can help to pay bills, someone who can communicate with with Medicare for you, someone who can uh, file your tax return, sign your name. They're essentially stepping into your shoes. Um, It's amazing how many people actually think that their spouse can do all of these things just simply by being their spouse. And that's not the case. Unless your spouse is named as your agent on a power of attorney, they're not going to be able to handle um, any financials that they're not named on as an as an owner. So if they're a joint owner, they have just as much a right as you. But if it's your own personal account, like an IRA or a 401k or even a regular bank account that's just in your name, just because someone is your spouse doesn't mean they have any access to that. They have to be named as your power of attorney. Mm. So when we're talking about this area of um, elder law, is this an area that's growing? I mean, you know, we have um, the population is is aging. I guess for the most part, people are living longer and healthier conditions. It's definitely a growing field. Um, you know, the baby boomers are all now getting to that point where um, they they are rushing to make sure they have things in place. Um, though we advise people that they should start to put things in place much earlier. Um, but it's a growing population, and at this point, living longer, not necessarily healthier. So we are, you know, dealing with a lot of. Um, needs for care at home, care in nursing homes, and things like that. Um, so I would say that, yeah, it's growing every day. Okay. You mentioned nursing homes, and as soon as the nursing homes are mentioned, very often a companion area of discussion is this idea of Medicaid eligibility. Yeah. Why is that so important? Well, it's a way of protecting assets 
that you've worked your whole life for um, and to be able to get some help uh, towards the cost of care uh, in, a, in a facility. So, you know, the costs are astronomical and um, probably only going to go up. And being able to preserve something and, uh, you know, contribute, of course, your income and, and things like that to your care uh, is, is really important to a lot of people, especially here on Long Island when the, uh, the home is typically the largest asset. People are, are very anxious to make sure that they can, uh, they can protect that asset uh, for themselves while they're alive and also to pass along to their children. Mm. What about situations where there are children who have special needs? Do you step in in that area too? Sure, we do. Um, we work with families who have children with special needs who uh, may need a guardianship. Uh, you know, once a child turns 18, they no longer, the parent no longer has the right to make decisions for them, whether it's health, financial, anything like that. So if a, a child is born with a disability and, uh, and then is, is coming on their 18th birthday, there are special guardianship proceedings that we handle to allow the parent to continue to, to make those decisions. And it's also very important when somebody's doing their own planning, um, if they have a child or a grandchild uh, with special needs, they want to make sure that their planning is done properly so that if that child is also on government benefits or has any sort of special programming, um, that the assets that are left to them don't upset those benefits. Mm. An area of discussion that could be viewed as a tough area to have in discussion is this whole idea of talking with one's parents about the topic of assisted living. Um, you know, most of us don't want to think about anything even close to a discussion like that. Right. But in the real world, there are times when that discussion is necessary. How do you suggest going about it, and what sort of things should we keep in mind? Well, it's very common for me to hear from adult children that they can't have this conversation or their parent doesn't want to, isn't interested, doesn't want to hear about it. I have the same problem with my own parents right now. You know, they, they want to just stay in their home. Mm -hmm. Whether it makes sense or it doesn't, that's where they want to be. Um, it's important to kind of be proactive about it, not to have the conversation in the middle of a crisis. You know, like uh, mom falls, now she's in the hospital, and we're at the bedside saying, you know, you can't go back home. It's already traumatic. It's already a lot going on. It's an important conversation to have before something happens um, and, and to have it in person, not uh, as a, you know, over the phone, quick conversation, not during the holidays, but just, you know, its own kind of um, conversation, maybe if you have uh, if there are siblings, you know, they can kind of all get together and have the conversation. Um, you want them to be part of the discussion, part of the process. Um, there are wonderful people who will take families around to different assisted livings, show them around, take them on, you know, tours, maybe go for a meal, things like that. Um, you know, you want to do that all together. You want to make sure mom and dad are part of the process, that they're empowered to make the decision for themselves. Um, you know, sometimes they're going to lash out, they're going to get angry, they're not going to want to talk about it, and that's okay. And then you should try to address it again. Um, but I find in my experience that if we can get people um, into these places to see them and to experience them a little bit, they often find them quite intriguing. You know, they're, they're, uh, it's nice to have some, some help. The assisted living, they're lovely places. Um, you know, they help with the laundry. They help with the, you know, with meal preparation all the way up to, you know, when someone's needs become really, really, uh, you know, severe. So it's, uh, it's a tricky conversation to have. And uh, it's hard to give advice because, Adult children know their ch know their parents better than I do, but you know I've been doing it a long time, and I and I tend to know uh, what works and what doesn't work. Mm. The whole idea of having this discussion, um, you also have to be on the lookout for short tempers. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, even during the transition itself. 
you know, they may uh, lash out. Like I said, they may <clears throat> be short with you, but y- you can't take it personally. You need to kind of see it from their perspective. I mean, I know my own parents have been in their house for, you know, almost 45 years. So to now kind of uproot everything and, you know, only be able to bring one or two pieces of furniture and, and have to get rid of a lot of stuff, I mean, it's it's a huge kind of upheaval. And, uh you know, they need to just, um, they, they need you to be there for them and, and, you know, kind of put yourself in their shoes. Mm. One of the things that we are seeing, and it's always disturbing to um, hear about senior scams, but we're seeing that they are on the rise. Uh, what's really fueling this and what sort of things are we seeing? Well, I think technology is really fueling this. I think that the capabilities um, for the scammers to um, really make themselves look, you know, like the real deal, um, has th- that ability has has really increased with technology. Um, I I now get calls. I got a call. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an email yesterday. Um, from an organization, and I said, oh, and I press, I touched on the email to see what the email was, because typically if you touch on the name, you can see where the email comes from, and it's never the place it says it is, mm-hmm. but this was. And I said, oh, why are they sending me this? This is strange, but, you know, my, my antenna goes right up, because I talk about this all the time. And it turned out that their database was hacked, um, and it was, uh, you know, telling me that they were going to withdraw $1,900 from my account, and I had to click here and do this and do that. And you have to remember that the senior population, you know, they're more going to be more vulnerable. They're not necessarily going to stop and say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. They're going to they're gonna panic, and, and the scammers play on their fears. They, they play on, on that vulnerability um, to try to get whatever they can. Tell us about the grandparent scams. Yeah, the grandparent scam is um, more or less uh, somebody calling and saying, you know, Grandma, Grandpa, I'm, uh, I'm in trouble, I'm in jail, or I'm on a trip abroad and I lost my credit card, I need money, um, and ask them to wire money. And, of course, you know, the grandparent's going to get nervous and flustered and, and um, you know, want to help the grandchild. Um, I experienced this myself uh, when I was at my parents' house with my dad, who is Greek, and all of his grandchildren call him Papu. Nobody calls him Grandpa. So when the phone call came in and the person on the other end said, Grandpa, I, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever, you know, they needed help, my father said, my grandchildren don't call me Grandpa, and he hung up. And I said, wow, that really just happened. Like, you know, I, you hear about it all the time, but to kind of witness it, and people need to just be – hypersensitive to what's on the other end of the phone, you know, to, to realize, you know, are they calling me by the name that my grandchild would normally call me or just hang up the phone and call the, call the grandchild back and see if they answer or call their parents, you know, your child and see what's going on. And most of the time you'll find that it, it, it has nothing to do with them. Mm. The lottery scams? The lottery scams are more of the, um, you know, you have a big prize waiting for you, but you need to pay the taxes or a fee before we can send you the money. Um, so, again, playing on the vulnerability, the, you know, the maybe excitement of winning something, the um, the idea of, you know, someone who's on a fixed income coming into a large sum of money, all of those things, um, you know, play into it. They factor into it. And so um, people are, are very quick to send this money over. So they'll say, you know, you have to pay $2,000 in taxes. Um, but you have to be careful um, with uh, and pay attention to what they're asking for. I've actually had clients who have gone and they wanted, you know, um, gift cards. They want you to send them the fees in gift cards. It doesn't. It just doesn't make sense. So it's important to kind of just slow down and think about what's going on. Mm. Speaking of taxes, what about the IRS scams? Well, the IRS scams are are probably the most popular. Um, we always tell clients, um, and we try to get out to the public. You know, the IRS is never going to call you on the phone. They're never going to send you an email. They're never going to show up at your door. 
um, they will write to you. They'll send you a letter if they need to to contact you. But they'll they'll call and really prey on on seniors, these scammers, um, and and scare them. You know, you owe this much in taxes, and you're going to be arrested, and you know things like that. And it's it, they just scare them so so badly to the point where it's just it, it's an irrational thing that they're doing because they're so frightened. So if somebody's asking you for your social security number over the phone. Never. Should never give a social security number, a bank routing number, um, credit card information. Um, really never over the phone, never over email. Um, it's it's really, really important to do that. As a matter of fact, I placed an order online for a piece of furniture and shortly after I placed it, I got a call from somebody saying they were calling me from the store and they went to put my order through and they accidentally canceled it. And could they have my information to put it back in? <laughs> oh, so I said, let me call you right back. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I called the store. I asked for that person. And lo and behold, it was him. He was there. He was in the store. And it actually it happened. But just, you know, doing that was enough for me to know, okay, this this was real, and I could, you know, I could go down to the store and I could give him the information. But it's a, it's a something as simple as that, you know, and some it's very easy for someone to say, okay, sure, let me give you my my card number. Right, because mm. many people will will do that um, again, thinking, eh, you know, what's what's it really going to? They're promising me this, or they're promising me that. Um, this is is what's required. This is what I right. should be doing. All right. That's kind of the way a lot of people's minds think. When we're talking about this idea of um, these scams, one of the areas that also comes up is something where the scammers play upon basically the loneliness that a lot of seniors experience. And here I'm talking about the romance scams. Yeah, um, we're seeing a lot more of this, and it's unfortunately, um, you know, very common with seniors who don't have anybody um, else that they see every day. They don't have, uh, you know, they have family members. They talk on the phone a couple times a week maybe, uh, you know, but they, they are lonely, and um, people are preying on, on these individuals and um, really forming relationships with them over the phone or by email to the point where the senior really believes that, you know, the person's in love with them, they're in a relationship, and then, you know, the request for money comes when that individual now wants to come meet the person, in, in the, the individual in person, wants to come, you know, to the United, in the United States and, and see them, and that's where the request for money comes in. And, you know, the, the senior is more than willing to, to send the money. They, you know, they want the companionship. They, at this point, they feel they're in a relationship. And uh, un unfortunately, that's, you know, that's sometimes where it ends and they never hear from the person again. Mm. Mm. We're talking on our program on the Sunday Magazine, talking with Melissa Negrin Wiener. She is uh, joined us by phone on our program is talking with us um, as representative, a partner at Genser Kona Elder Law, which is based on Long Island. She manages the government benefits department. Uh, Genser Law, G-E-N-S-E-R-L-A-W, is their website. It's Genser Law, all is one word, dot com, their website. And their uh, main number is 631-390-5000. Before we let you go, I want you to talk a little bit about seeing your dreams come true, because this is an interesting venture. Oh, sure. Um, Senior Dreams Come True is um, our signature program for our uh, 501c3. We have a, a nonprofit arm of our firm. And uh, Senior Dreams is somewhat similar to uh, the way Make-A-Wish works. We try to grant wishes for low-income seniors on Long Island and in the boroughs. And we fundraise all year long. We grant wishes on a revolving basis, so we're always looking for wishes. The criteria is on our website as far as um, income. It's an income limitation, uh, the criteria. And uh, really granting wishes, anything from a basic need to fulfilling a lifelong dream, we've 
helped people pay for dental work. We've, uh, we helped a woman uh, get down to Florida to see her new grandchild because she couldn't afford the airfare. Um, so we, uh, we partner up with great people across the island to help us out sometimes, and, um, and it's, it's really served to be a great program. So we're always looking for wishes. And um, as I understand, there's going to be a benefit in May of 2020? Yes, May 17th, um, we are still trying to um, kind of nail down the, the, the place, but um, it will be on May 17th, and uh, we're doing um, a program called Long Island's Funniest Senior. So we uh, want to have a comedy show with uh, seniors on the island so people can reach out to us if they think that, uh, that they fit the bill, and it's going to be a great fundraiser for Senior Dreams Come True. So this, the participants will actually do five minutes of stand-up. That's right. I think that's a wonderful idea. It should be fun. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us on our program. Certainly the best with your work, and thanks for sharing the information you have with us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.